Yes. So actually it is 12 o'clock. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to go through exactly what we're doing so that the audience is prepared. Uh, my name is Kelly O'Brien and I am the executive director of the Chicago Central Area Committee. Thank you for taking time to join us today as we kick off three days of programming focused on creating a new future for Chicago Central City Burnham Council webinar series. With us today, we have the president of the Burnham Council, Andrew Broderick, who is a senior associate at Perkins and Will. After Andrew does a quick introduction, um, we will be taught, I'm going to set the stage in terms of the work of the Chicago Central Area Committee. And then I'm gonna hand it off to Chris Hall, who is an urban strategy leader at SOM and a very devoted CCAC member. Chris will really help us understand um, some key changes and forecasts and some uh, metrics that will be really important for this conversation. And then we're going to have a panel dis uh, discussion. I'll introduce our distinguished panel and we will invite the audience to use the Q&A button for questions. And I'll do my best to relay them to our panelists and get you answers. We will wrap up by talking about next steps and remind you about the programming that will be happening tomorrow and Thursday. So with that, um, again, good afternoon. Andrew, how are you today? I'm doing great, happy to be here. Yeah, looking forward to this. Excellent, excellent. So Andrew, can you share um, with the audience a little bit about the Burnham Council and why the Burnham Council decided to organize this programming? Yeah, absolutely. Great. So yeah, again, the Burnham Council is CCAC's next generation leadership group. And we formed just over a year ago under the title of the Burnham Council. Uh, our group um, is, um, is really dedicated to focusing on programming and networking uh, for CCAC initiatives. And there's eight of us on the leadership team. David Scully, who you'll meet in a moment, is, 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 is my colleague on the Burnham Council leadership team. And we started over the summer or so thinking about, okay, what does a return to downtown look like? What's the future of our central area look like? And so since that point in time to today, uh, we've been organizing these the events that, that really start today, tomorrow, and Thursday on these different panel discussions. And Chris Hall will provide a little bit of insight into those uh, momentarily, but I just wanna say it's been really great as a as Burnham Council providing a voice for uh, for the future of our central area and providing some leadership um, within, within thinking about the future in a different way. So uh, thank you. Well, thank you, Andrew. Thank you for all of the work that you do on behalf of CCAC and the Burnham Council. We're very grateful for the commitment that Perkins and Will have provided for years and years um, to this organization. And the Burnham Council, it was created just three or four years ago, and it has become a critical part of the work that we do. So thank you for that. Great. And so for uh, any audience members that are not familiar with our work, CCAC published a white paper in the spring of 2019 titled A Central City Strategy for All. There were real um, focus areas, three focus areas that uh, dealt with catalytic economic initiatives, new mobility, and digital connectivity for all. If you have not had a chance to review this white paper, it is available on the CCAC website. Under our work, there's a drop down box that says initiatives, and we invite you to see both the white paper and a slide deck that you know, helps to complement the white paper. And when we published this in May of last year, we were really excited to team up with World Business Chicago and kicked off what was called the Corridor Revitalization Initiative, where we worked with community leaders as they selected two block corridors in five different neighborhoods. And this work really started before Commissioner Cox was confirmed, before the city started in Beth Southwest. And so when we finished phase one of the Corridor Revitalization Initiative, we were thrilled when we were asked to partner with the Chicago Department of Planning and Development and work hand in hand with the very talented staff there in helping to draft and provide renderings for RFPs for development opportunities in the neighborhoods in the Invest Southwest program. So one of the things that I'm particularly proud of is the fact that CCAC really leads from a thought leadership standpoint but then we're doers and we make things happen. 
And that's really the role that we want to be able to play as we acknowledge that downtown is not the same as it was earlier this year. And so with that, I would like to invite Chris Hall, who again is an urban strategy leader for SOM, to give us some background on the white paper that was published and some work, uh, some of the important metrics that were in this paper and may have changed with all that has happened over the course of 2020. So Chris. Great, thanks Kelly. Um, so the, as uh, Andrew touched on, the impetus for this is really the understanding of this really unusual time in terms of public health situation, uh, really the end of an economic cycle that came very abruptly to an end before all of us anticipated. And of course, uh, the significant uh, questions around uh, social justice and equity that were always there, but really came to the fore this year. So we thought it was important to start thinking about how do we come back from that? How does Chicago come back in a world which is incredibly competitive between cities and downtowns have become central cities, way more diverse than traditional office cores. But how do we compete against those other central cities across the country and across the world, but also use it as an opportunity to think about the relationship uh, between the central city and the growth potential it has, and also leveraging opportunities for neighbors. And we also thought, looking back and understanding what happened after the Great Recession, that these next couple of years will be really critical from 2021 to 2024, kind of just, just over the, um, the vaccine horizon. Um, so we thought it was a really opportune time to look at this and think about the role of all of the sectors that make up the central city and our entire community going forward. So I'll just touch on a couple of the, the kind of where we were in 2019. So if you go to the next slide, um, and we'll just go through this quickly and then get to the conversation. You know, this is from work we did in 2019. So it's interesting just to see what a short time ago, how the world felt. So we felt like we were in the midst of a boom um, in terms of individual buildings and, and in terms of large scale projects. Next. And the, we had seen significant jobs growth uh, in the central area uh, in the comeback from the, recession, the Great Recession, really significant increase in the number of jobs. Next. Um, and we were also seeing part of a national trend where jobs were moving from suburbs to cities and corporations were really seeing the advantage of, of being in central cities. And Chicago did very well as a, as a competitor in corporate investment game uh, in terms of business relocations during that time. Next. Uh, but we also had challenges. You know, Chicago was not um, growing at the pace of the other uh, large metro areas and population growth was, uh, was kind of contained and constrained here as compared with other cities who were starting to move forward much more quickly in terms of big cities, but also smaller cities, the Nashvilles, the Austins, the Pittsburghs were really seeing significant growth. Next. And within Chicago, we were seeing this pattern of um, you know, loss of population in some neighborhoods, but then also significant concentration of growth in the central city. So that felt kind of on a balance to us. And we wanted to think about how we could uh, reconcile this. And equity was uh, on the table at that point as well. You know, we were really aware and you know, there was a central driving theme of the work we did in 2019 was how do we address this disconnect or something of a disconnect between um, the central city and the, and the, and the, the neighborhoods. Next. And so where are we now? So that was a really quick snapshot of how the world felt then. And of course, this is a graph that could look like any kind of graph for metrics for the last couple of years, but this is GDP. So this United States uh, GDP, so significant trail off, a fall off earlier this year. And these are the forecasts of where we go next. And the, the the projections are that the economy basically gets back to a level set um, later in 2021 uh, under various forecasts. And that means that, that we've lost 18 months to two years worth of growth, which is highly unusual. So it doesn't mean everything's fine in six months time. It means we've got a, a challenging position to begin from. Next. And that rolls through to the unemployment forecast as well. So you can see we were running below 4% um, 
through 2019. And the forecasts are that it could be some years before we get back to that level. So we're going to have elevated unemployment um, uh, through 2021 and into 2022. Next. Uh, so this is a debate we could all talk about forever. This, this is like, you know, the planner's favorite conversation was the future of work. But there's an emerging consensus. There's some great work by CBRE and ULI around this. So the workplace has shifted, uh, but office, it's not the end of the office. The offices will remain the dominant location for my covering employment, but there'll be new models and flexibilities around. Next Retail, the great transition, you know, this is a culmination of trends that have been happening for decades, uh, and particularly in the last couple of years. And this, this event has really brought this to the fore, hitting uh, particular sectors, uh, but also particular types of businesses as well. Small businesses that were not cash rich have really been hit. And I think that's what we've seen in Central City as well, particularly as they've uh, released the cafes, restaurants, small independent businesses. Next Hotel, you know, that, again, you know, it could have been a graph we saw earlier, that really immediate and catastrophic hit on hotel occupancy. But the forecasts are that it will come back, but it will come back by 2023 and will start to rise uh, once the vaccine is in circulation and people start to move around again. The, the projections are that travel and business travel and uh, tourism travel ultimately uh, will come back and, and it's uh, strong and resilient. Next. And residential, you know, everybody's spending more time at home as many of us are finding right now. So um, the expectation about the amenity of home itself and then also the amenity of the neighborhood you're in is really coming to the fore. But we're also seeing a major generational shift with the millennials moving into family formation years. Um, and Gen Z, the next generation, the next cohort, actually being significantly smaller than millennials. So that has impacts in terms of our housing markets and also um, how we think about the um, uh, population of the city going forward. Next. And then affordability changes. You know, the residential boom that has been seen across the country in recent years has actually left us, uh, many people behind. The, uh, the new stock that's been created has not generated enough affordable housing to meet uh, the, the needs of the, the income structure. Next. And equity, I think, you know, as we all know, uh, has really come to the fore and has really elevated this year. And I think it was a central concept in the Recovery Task Force report that was put together which really called for, you know, it says an economic model based on inclusive growth that takes a holistic approach to development across both downtown and our neighborhoods. And I think that's a really powerful message to take forward. The next, so multiple dynamics, there's, you know, absences, there's disruption, acceleration, we have a recession, uh, but that really sets the stage for what we need to do next and to achieve a stronger recovery and more equitable recovery than we did in 2010. The next. Um, and there are layers to this. There's kind of how do we respond to the disruption and the recession we just talked about? How do we compete more effectively? How do we achieve the growth we need? And that's, um, there are commitments to grow population and we need to grow jobs. And how do we make sure the equity agenda continues with connections between central city growth and neighborhood? So next. And we also had thoughts about how you might think about this in terms of phasing. There's a near-term tactical approach, but then there is this kind of restoration period where we maximize recovery. And then a longer-term strategy that really aligns with these wider urban trends we're seeing. So next. So Kelly, hand it back to you. Excellent. So we're going to talk about um, these three themes over the course of today, tomorrow, and Thursday. You should have received registration links for all three days at 9.05 this morning. And I'm going to just stop the screen here and introduce our panelists. So I'd like to start by thanking uh, Deputy Mayor for Neighborhood and Economic Development, Samir Mayakar, for joining us today. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. We also have with us Brad Henderson, the CEO of P33, and a Burnham Council leader and Associate Director and Urban Designer with SOM, David Scully. So welcome gentlemen, thank you for being here today. 
let me begin by just kind of throwing it out there. Um, who would like to respond to what you just heard Chris share with us? I guess I can get us started. Um, uh, thanks, Kelly, and thanks to the whole team at CCAC for you know everything that you do, especially to support the city of Chicago at a very unique time. You know, I think what you just heard from Chris, it shows the, the just how unprecedented the challenges that we face, not only as a city, but as a country and so many places around the world are facing. You know, when you think about it, we're facing a 100 year pandemic stacked on top of a 75 year economic crisis stacked on top of a 50 year level of civil unrest. And I think what that means for cities um, is yet to be seen. Um, but what we do know is that disaster, natural disasters and economic challenges in the past when they have tested cities, cities have innovated, they've been resilient, that they come out stronger. And so we like to, to say here in Chicago that, you know, after the fire, we had innovations, right? We had a new building code that got developed and that new building code led to the advent of the first skyscraper I think in the case of this pandemic, it's gonna really shape the way that we think about work. It's gonna shape the way that we think about uh, open space. And really it's gonna shape the way that we think about amenities of urban living. And I think Chris highlighted some of that. And so we're looking forward to engaging in a series of dialogues uh, over, the, over the course of the next couple of months to really think about what the future of the central area especially will be. And the one thing I will mention is um, that the city of Chicago, uh, along with our uh, colleagues in the private sector, published the first recovery task force report of any Amer American city uh, coming out of COVID. And so in that 100 page blueprint, you have a lot of priorities that were identified um, by the group in terms of how, not just now in the next few months as we think about vaccinations and you know the, the, the minutia of how we get out of COVID, but really over the next 18 to 24 months, as that economic trajectory improves, as Chris mentioned, how do we make sure that Chicago is positioned for not only equitable recovery, but how do we recover out of this recession faster than the last recession in 2008? And so those are some of the key issues that we're grappling with and we look forward to engaging in this dialogue with CCAC. Thank you, thank you. And, and Brad, you know, you're really looked at as a leader in terms of driving the tech economy here in Chicago and the Chicagoland area. Can you talk a little bit about that sector and what other sectors you see growing the Chicago economy? Great, yes, and thank you so much for having me. Very grateful and um, you know, incredibly grateful for all the work uh, that the, the mayor's office and Samira are doing on this during this very difficult time. So I'm an optimist. And I think there's a lot of data um, and trends that are bull or the tailwind trends for Chicago that I, I'd hope we'd all pay attention to. There are three I'll briefly mention. The first is um, this has been a great year for Chicago in terms of how leading science can be translated into growth and jobs. And so if I think about an L shape that extends from Hyde Park into the West Loop through the South side of Chicago, there's been over a billion and a half dollars of new resources from the federal, state, and local government and private resources put into basic and applied research in areas like quantum and life sciences. Chicago has actually won the race nationally for quantum computing in 2020. Now, we should recognize them. quantum computing is about a $100 million industry right now, so we won't uh, turn around our economy on the backs of quantum this year because of it. By 2030, it will be a trillion dollar industry. And so if you just think about what's happened in Hyde Park, what's happened at IIT, Discovery Partners Institute, new life sciences facilities on the west side of Chicago, new research capacity in the Evanston, or the Northwestern campus downtown, that is an incredible amount of progress in what has been a very difficult time otherwise. And so as we think about revitalizing those corridors in downtown, translating science into jobs will be part of that story. The second thing I'd mention is we often don't think about one of the big sectors that will drive growth in Chicago as what we call the growth stage of the venture capital market. So we think of startups as sort of three people in a garage with a little bit of funding, and that's where they all start. And what's amazing is over the past 10 years, Chicago has excelled in building that early stage of the market. We have about 3,200 startups right now. But where these startups really start to affect a central business area, really start to drive employment, is when they start to scale, when they start to expand, when they get into the series B, series D, series D part of their funding. 
And that's where, again, during the crisis, Chicago has actually led uh, and really advanced. And so if you look at the number of companies in Chicago that have gotten checks of 80, 100, $120 million from funders to go out and hire hundreds of people uh, and, and to think about where those people will, will really come together post pandemic to solve problems. You know, Amazon was a startup. Amazon hired, I think 400,000 people this year. The question is Chicago and what we believe is Chicago has um, our own versions of Amazon in our midst that will be the future employers at scale. And so how do we incorporate that into the strategy that we all, all work on together for the downtown business district and the surrounding neighborhoods? The last thing I'll briefly mention that has me incredibly excited is um, no matter what has happened, uh, the ability to attract and retain diverse talent is still the name of the game. Mm -hmm. And we're blessed. We, we operate in the uh, second largest market in the country for computer science graduates. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if you think about the makings of a great economy, that's where things start. And there's just been incredible work done over the past 18 months, despite all of our challenges, um, to further diversify and retain the talent. Um, and, you know, it has been hard for you know, young talent to really think about downtown as a great place to spend time the past 12 months. They're social, they're building their lives. And, uh, uh, and, and you know, it's, it's hard when you're locked in your studio apartment to do that. Um, but that talent still is craving connection, purpose, and meaningful jobs. And that advantage will still be there uh, a year from now when we all get back to a, a new normal, uh, an ability to really interact. And so I would just say, if you think about the amount of hiring that's going to happen in Chicago from a tech talent perspective and how critical density and connectivity is going to be to that physical density, um, I think we're very well positioned if we continue to collaborate uh, and work together. Well, that is very encouraging. Thank you, Brad. And, and David, you know, we have worked together now for several years, and this year alone, we've worked on projects specific to the neighborhoods. So I wonder if you could comment on your thoughts on how we can build stronger business relationships between the central city and the neighborhoods, whether in terms of location or business to business kind of sales. Absolutely. And, and I think there's, there's a tremendous opportunity there with, you know, sort of people uh, and the neighborhoods and understanding uh, and developing a greater understanding of the assets that are there. You know, I think that's something that, you know, sometimes may get overlooked at the larger scale. And I think one of Chris's points earlier about the holistic understanding of the dynamic between the central city and those neighborhoods and how we can leverage the transit connections that are already there. And I think something that uh, the mayor's office and, and others have been really uh, excited about, uh, which is the equitable transit oriented development work that, uh, that Elevated Chicago and others have been doing, uh, trying to look at those opportunities on the south and on the west side uh, and continuing to kind of loop that in with the invest southwest work and then how that dovetails with the uh with the uh we will uh you know city planning initiative uh so i think there's a lot of opportunity for us to use those uh as ways to then identify those places where you can then say okay you know startup, we have space for you on the west side of Chicago, on the south side, near this transit node, and that's going to help us build a, you know, sort of nexus at a, at a, pers at a point. Uh, one of the projects that we, you know, worked on uh, with the University of Chicago, looking at the 63rd and Cottage Grove intersection, trying to understand that exact sort of dynamic where you could connect nonprofit, you can connect uh, small businesses, you can connect, uh, you know, sort of university assets that, you know, may work better or are more associated with community uh, and use that to then create a, a center and a hub that can not only supply and benefit the larger businesses and institutions, uh, but also benefit the neighborhood and provide places where they can uh, connect and, and grow uh, the small businesses that are there. Great, great. And again, thank you for all the work that you have done. And, and so Deputy Mayor, I'd like to come back to you. And you know, one of the things that CCAC is so proud of as a 65 year old civic group or almost 65 years old, um, the organization and its members have really been at the forefront of helping Chicago grow into the global destination that it is. So I wonder in kind of in this crisis year, a global pandemic, um, what other cities, big cities are you looking at either nationally or internationally for best practices that you think may bring benefit here, you know, to, to our home? 
Yeah, it's a good question. You know, we, we have a cohort of, uh, you know, my counterparts basically all across um, North America, actually. And so we, especially the beginning of the pandemic, we were talking weekly just to share best practices on everything from small business support to, you know, then it became about the shutdown policies to then how do you reopen? Um, and Mayor Lightfoot actually is, is in pretty constant contact with a lot of her uh, mayoral peers. Um, on the international stage, you know, we've, because this, the course of the pandemic has been varied, you know, it, it, it kind of hit Asia first and then it hit Europe harder and then it hit us. And so we, we really were purposeful in reaching out uh, to our colleagues in Asia, to our colleagues in Europe to understand um, what policies they were, they were putting into place. And what we learned, you know, a couple of interesting factoids, right? We learned that in, in, in Asia, for example, um, when they had gotten a hold of the virus and they kind of gotten case rates uh, to be very low, and you saw this in Korea, you saw this in China, um, pretty rapidly, you saw the leisure travel industry uh, recover um, uh, uh, very rapidly. You know, their hotel occupancy was at where it was before the pandemic during their large national holidays. And so it, it kind of reinforces that notion that we need to handle the pandemic to have that economic recovery. In Europe, what we learned is in, if you look at the case study of Sweden versus Denmark, um, Sweden famously until about two days ago, uh, really wasn't shutting down parts of their economy. They were just letting kind of people um, adhere to their own policies and just encouraging things like mass compliance. And then Denmark did the opposite. They had a more, you know, what I'll say Chicago style, you know, do shelter at home sort of orders. Um, the difference between those two countries in economic activity was less than 5%. And so, again, it shows you that if consumers don't have confidence um, that they're not going to go out there and, and consume um, because it's all about the pandemic. So those are just two anecdotes from a European standpoint and Asian standpoint as to what we've learned. It's navigated how we've developed kind of surgical policy here in the, in the country. And what I'll say is, we are really excited, you know, at the prospects of a federal government that takes this seriously. We know that we need the federal government to act right now with more small business support, especially. Um, and, and we're optimistic about 2021, but we can't, you know, shy away from the fact that there's 11 million unemployed people in this country right now. A lot of those benefits are drying up um, and at least uh, case rates and, and fatalities across the country are hitting record highs. So we're not out of the woods and we need to be taking this very, very seriously, despite how fatigued we are all are of doing these Zoom calls and, you know, staying at home. So, you know, on behalf of the Lightfoot administration, can you share with us what the thoughts are in terms of the role of city government versus the role of the private sector and the role of how, you know, there can be collaboration to really bring back downtown? Well, what I'd say is we all need each other. You know, I think um, the city government doesn't have a magic bullet. Um, and I know that the private sector doesn't either and that you can't do this without a strong partnership with, uh, with the public sector. So in many ways, the high degree of interconnectedness um, is one potential benefit coming out of this pandemic. It, it's caused new forms of collaboration. You know, the hospital systems in Chicago ruthlessly competed with each other. And actually during this pandemic, they've had to work together to handle things like surge capacity um, and other forms of you know, ICU and bed management and even equipment and PPE management. So in terms of what you know, we all need to be doing together, um, you know, we need the business sector's help to you know, right now um, get folks to stay at home, encourage that mass compliance, you know, encourage vaccination down the road, just some of those basics. But as we think about how do we bring back downtown, we're going to have to work together to bring back confidence in the health system um, and that when the virus rates are low, safely returning employees back to work. Um, I think that starts with leadership um, and that once we have leadership back at the office, then in a, in a safe and voluntary way, you have the rest of the workforce gets, you know, have them come back. But it's really going to be difficult to have a vi vibrant and thriving downtown until we get our workforce back downtown. And so I know what the private sector needs from the city besides public health management is, you know, confidence in the transportation system and also the schools to be open. 
uh, because childcare is a huge challenge um, when everyone's remote learning. So it shows you that we're very symbiotic uh, and I'm optimistic about the future, but what I will say is it's gonna take a high degree of engagement, communication and partnership um, because any one of these variables between the business sector and the private sector can't solve this. It has to happen with all of us working together. Thank you. And you know, Brad, I wanna look at kind of post vaccine and you brought up the uh, talent equation. So tell me what you think um, we need to do or kind of best practices again, in order to make sure that we retain the talent that's here or attract a talent as, as well as train talent for the new economy. Great. Uh, there are two big things we think should be a shared agenda. The first is um, uh, really providing access um, to a lot of folks um, who traditionally have been left out of the, uh, the, that ladder um, to a more skilled and higher paying job. And so you know, we work with about 25 companies in Chicago of all sizes uh, and industries that are what we call the Talent Coalition, where they've shared with us their biggest needs. And their biggest needs are they're massively short tech talent, and it, particularly that talent is not diverse enough. And so one of the biggest initiatives that we're working on that I think should be a shared goal is, um, uh, and this is a, a, just a, two fascinating statistics I'd hope we'd all embrace. The first is um, our tech industry is 12% people of color in a city that's over 60% people of color. So we have to change that. Uh, and what's even more interesting is despite this really strong interest in getting more people of color into our workforce, downtown, in tech jobs, or in uh, some of our neighborhoods, um, our employers are only in present in front of 7% of our diverse tech students. 93% of the diverse tech students in Chicago did not have a major presence from large local employers. And so a lot of the work that we're doing is how do you actually help these employers go to schools like Illinois Tech or UIC or Chicago State that they haven't historically hired a lot from where they've relied more on New Chicago or Northwestern um, uh, or Urbana and really tap into city colleges and to build uh, a, a tech pipeline that, that works for all. That is a huge opportunity for us. And, and I think an area where we could lead, if we got good at this, employers from around the country would be interested in tapping into that because you know Chicago has an opportunity to be a real leader in creating diverse pipelines into those types of jobs. The second thing is, you know, it is fair to say we still have a retention problem with the people who grew up here and trained here, but don't live here anymore. And, and we um, are excited because we've, in our research, we've um, tapped into some really interesting data that says there is a Chicago boomerang market um, that is available to our employers. Most people who've spent time in our region uh, are very fond of it. Uh, they had a good experience. They remember their school years or growing up here. They have a mom who's growing older who they'd like to spend more time with, et cetera. And um, there are two pieces of data we found that if we work together, we can really tap into. The first is, uh, you know, it, it's not the most affordable city in, in the country. And we all can complain about lots of the bills that we get and how much it costs. But the data says we still are the 27th most expensive city. 27th. That's not one, two, three, or four. That's 27th, which means if you're moving from Seattle or San Francisco, we're really affordable. Um, and the second thing is there's this perception of people who've left that we don't have a deep labor market for highly skilled technical jobs. You know, it's almost this sense of, well, all the jobs in tech are in San Francisco. And what's interesting is you look at the data over the past 10 years, that labor market in Chicago has gotten very deep but there's a perception problem. They're not aware of all the opportunities, particularly in dual income households, where that move to a new moving home creates risk. And so the big thing I'd urge all of us is, I, I actually think there's a great story for us to work on together around bringing people back who've left, um, uh, where they can raise a family and have a great career at an affordable way, and bringing lots of people into um, uh, the labor market, into the skilled labor market who've been left out historically. Thank you. And I am going to ask the audience to please use the Q&A button and I'll be happy to relay your questions. In fact, um, there was one question that came in and I think that um, for those that have listened to our previous summit or saw my op-ed in Cranes, it is um, referencing the technology to have an app on our phone for contact tracing. So it's something that I'm a big advocate of. And uh, Deputy Mayor, it reads, can we tie public health and mask wearing to economic recovery? 
For example, if restaurants want to open indoors, they have to accept a contact tracing app um, where then people would have confidence that if they were there and somebody subsequently tested positive, that they would be alerted. Yeah, you know, we're with you on this. Um, and that is something we're looking at. Uh, what, what I'll say is this, though, we have to make all these decisions with an equity lens and recognize, you know, that not every Chicagoan has a phone that can have an app. Um, what we found when we've done contact tracing is a lot of people don't like when the government calls. So they don't pick up the phone or they don't want to engage with our public health officials, even if it's about talking about contact tracing. So there are some barriers to really reach um, all of, you know, all of Chicago. And what I'll say is for some of this to be effective, you're, you're talking about 50 to 70% sort of compliance and adoption, which is a greater market share than Apple has. Um, so, you know, I, I just, we have to be a little realistic, I think, about um, some of these solutions. And, and we, we have something called the Shy COVID Coach, which is an app that the public health department has launched to do some of this. Um, but really what we want to try and do is get to the fundamentals, right? I think you identify it face mask, you know, compliance, and that we do are capturing information to be able to do contact tracing. You know, what is the vaccine card going to look like? What is the killer app? Um, some of these things require, um, you know, are going to have to come from the federal government. When we benchmark other countries, that's where it's come from. And so we're going to keep engaging in that dialogue. But there isn't really a magic app solution to this kind of a challenge, given the high amount of adoption it would have to have and the dis disparities between populations in the city. Um, I, I also defer, I know Brad's probably thought a lot about this too with his tech hat on, um, but, but you know, certainly we're on the same page there, but it's not easy to de mass deploy in the city. Sure. I, I, if yeah. I could just add, I, I think Samir uh, has always summarized it well. Um, you know, the application of technology to contact tracing is neither a panacea nor um, you know, of no value. Uh, the, the reality is the coronavirus is going to be with us for a while, which means we need to keep thinking about it. Um, and, and so what I would say is um, I do think there's a lot more room to use these technologies as we think about our solutions for 2021. Uh, and I'd encourage you all to learn more. I think some of the more promising applications will be um, actually the University of Illinois has developed something called the Rockwire app that they com combine with their testing capabilities. And if you think about schools and universities as big areas where young people congregate, um, there's a lot to be done there. There are also a lot of private market uh, solutions where employers can take the lead on some of these things. Um, and, and some of the local Chicago companies actually are deploying these overseas, but not here. And so I, I think it sort of in the spirit of the conversation today, we owe it to ourselves to ask the public private partnership question around the use of technology and contact tracing for 2021 and finding not mass or um, uh, everyone has to do it applications, but very targeted ones that could really help us. We didn't get enough of that in the first wave. I think there are just so many hard privacy questions and equity questions, et cetera, um, that we didn't get to, but, but we should think long and hard about them for the, the, the summer and beyond. Thank you. And so, um, you know, David, one thing as an architect, you know, Governor Pritzker had deemed construction an essential service. So I wonder if you can talk about trends in the built environment and again, in terms of what you are seeing post vaccine. Yeah, I think I think there's definitely a sense of like, how does the, you know, built environment environment respond to a lot of the trends that we're seeing, whether it's uh, starting to look at offices uh, and how those buildings, uh, HVAC syst systems are working, you know, how to reduce the amount of surfaces that people are touching to, you know, sort of allow for people to uh, just not have to have that intimate, you know, sort of contact as we as we typically had. Uh, as Chris mentioned, you know, sort of there there will probably still be a bit of work from home sort of happening, or you know, kind of finding its way into how traditional office operates. Uh, but I think there's there's also a big question on on housing and and not just housing. Uh, you know, sort of how housing is configured uh, and, you know, how we've all kind of been forced into making, uh, you know, sort of bedrooms and living rooms into office spaces uh, and how can we start to, you know, kind of really rethink the workspace at home, uh, but also, you know, sort of how does that, you know, maybe uh, 
connect and dovetail with how to attract, you know, sort of the talent that, you know, sort of Brad and Samir talked about, you know, sort of how do we start to, you know, find those spaces and, and create a, a network of affordable affordability uh, that can really allow for uh, more variety and more types of, 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 of housing where people can, uh, can engage one another. Uh, and, you know, David, I think we're going to be really focusing on housing a lot on Thursday with our livability mm-hmm. program. So I wonder if from your perspective, you know, offices are changing. I mean, people, mm-hmm. some people like working at home. Some people are going to want to do a hybrid. So again, do you have any thoughts from an economic standpoint post vaccine, how, you know, reconfiguring office space and how that part of our economy, you know, may, um, may flourish or not by this time next year and moving forward? Well, I don't think it will change dramatically. The other thing that we're maybe seeing is, is, you know, sort of this, the density and the spacing of office you know, sort of be operating in a, in a little bit of a different way. Uh, you know, maybe, you know, previously you may have sat, you know, very close to your, you know, partner. We, we just renovated our office and uh, we densified a bit. And I think, you know, kind of we, we, we actually didn't get to open our new office. We hit COVID right when we finished the renovation. So I think that really changed uh, a lot of how that will, uh, you know, sort of operate in different ways. Like, do you, do you then start to schedule, you know, sort of how uh, people work from home and people are in the office? So you reduce the number of people that are coming into the office on a day-to-day basis. Uh, but I think, as, as Chris mentioned, a lot of the things that I'm seeing, a lot of things that, you know, kind of the, the trends uh, are that it will come back. Uh, to a near normal, uh, you know, sort of operation. Uh, and there may be little things in the office, whether you're, you're not touching the, the keypad, the, there's an app on your phone that allows you to operate the elevator or you're using your foot or, or that sort of thing. There's different technologies that, I, that I've seen, I think in, in a recent office building, they actually did install the foot, uh, foot operation for elevators. Mm-hmm. So you'll see things like that, uh, that are allowing us to really, you know, sort of still connect without having to have as much of a contact uh, with surfaces or, you know, sort of how things are operating. I think there's also, there was a trend around sort of flex and hot desking that I think, you know, kind of COVID really challenges a little bit. Like, you know, if you're, if you don't have a standard, you know, sort of desk, you know, sort of then how do you keep up the hygiene in, in those spaces? So I think those operational and logistical questions are, you know, sort of things that are coming up. I think formally or like, you know, sort of how the office is actually shaped uh, won't won't change uh, a whole, whole lot, at least from, from what I've seen. Thank you, David. So Deputy Mayor, you know, um, part of making downtown robust is bringing people back. So one of the questions that we have is, how does transit factor into the future of downtown? We are facing potentially massive transit cuts in 2021 if there's not a huge federal relief bill. So what are the thoughts in terms of transit for the city? Well, when you think about our competitiveness as, a, as an economy, um, and, and I spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, what, what should our economic development strategy be? I think, you know, gone are the days that it's an incentives game, right? This notion of, you know, to get an Amazon HQ2 here, it's about who can throw more money at the second largest employer in the, in the country, right? It, and and cl- it's very clear now that it's about infrastructure and, and talent. Um, and, and, and Brad's kind of focused on that. And the cost of living is a, is a huge advantage as well. So in the infrastructure side, our transit network, you know, we have one of the most connected cities uh, in the world, and it's a huge asset of Chicago. During the pandemic, we were the only large city in the country to not cut back on CTA service. Um, because if you're an essential worker, you, you live in a neighborhood and you're needing to get to, you know, a hospital or a grocery store, um, we didn't want to cut back service. And that was really important to Mayor Lightfoot with her focus on equity. But you're exactly right. Um, more, you know, federal support is going to be needed based on the huge revenue shortfall that these transit systems have had to see in between Metro and CTA. Um, I, I think the first important thing to note is the finances. And we're working with the federal uh, delegation to making sure um, that that's addressed, that that's a big issue. The second is, is uh, you know, COVID protocols and safety. I've been a CTA and Metro commuter since February, coming to work every week and um, it's incredibly safe, possibly cleaner than ever. Uh, And so, you know, I think that we need to build more confidence and market that um, because it is safe to be on public transit systems. Um, And then the third is also working with employers to change 
the kind of protocols are going to work. And so part of what keeps those transit systems safe is going to be staggering shifts probably when we're still socially distancing. Um, and I know that the Chicagoland Chamber of Commerce is engaged in that, but that's going to be vital as well so that, you know, th that the notion of rush hour changes a bit. Um, and given all the other changes we've had in our, the course of our work life uh, today, you know, that, that should be fairly uh, manageable um, just given all the other sacrifices we've had to make. So, you know, as a, as a follow-up to that, one a question that was submitted reads, the Loop has 370,000 daily workers. What do the panelists predict the final return rate or what percentage of people will stay working from home? Any thoughts on that? What have you seen? Uh, I guess I could start. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't hear I didn't hear Brad or David uh, jumping in here. <laughs> My internet is terrible right now. <laughs> so uh, we've seen there was a Wall Street Journal piece on this last week. The average occupancy rate downtown is around twenty percent, and that's right around where Chicago is. I think the highest one city in the south might be at forty percent. Um, there's no doubt that there's going to be some type of new normal where maybe Fridays and Mondays um, are different, and there's a slightly larger workforce working from home or their neighborhood hubs um, um, uh, slightly more. Um, but also there's the trend David mentioned, which is, you know, the densification of workplaces is probably gonna de-densify. Um, so my, my guess on this is companies need innovation, especially the knowledge economy. And, and there's just only so much innovation you're gonna be able to do on Zoom. And that physically being present is, is going to be important long-term. So I think, you know, people are predicting that you either won't have a huge change in the kind of occupancy rate or it's going to be in that like 10 percent range. Um, and it could possibly be offset if we do our job with recovery and growth and attracting new companies, uh, which is the focus. So there will be some change, but I don't think it's as dramatic uh, as what people might be projecting. Brad? I think it's a wise observation. So probably uh, not not good at predicting uh, things. You know, I, I uh, but what I would say is, um, uh, I don't know how long it will take, um, but I presume we'll get back to uh, a feeling that is very similar to how it felt in January of 2019, um, sometime in the next few years. And, and the reason I say that is, you know, so I, I'd spent 20 years before I joined PC, BC, uh, P33 at, at working at the Boss Consulting Group, mm -hmm. where I had the joy of flying 500,000 miles a year. Uh, and um, I remember uh, what it was like uh, when people made predictions after September 11th, you know, that real tragedy about what would happen to airline travel. And I remember checking into a hotel uh, in the middle of the financial crisis in 2008 uh, and being the only person who checked into a hotel that day. Uh, because the hotel was empty and no one was doing anything because all the businesses were collapsing mm -hmm. uh, and these questions being asked then. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just think it, it, you know, we need to recognize that solving the world's most pressing problems means colliding in person with other really smart, talented, motivated people um, who want to, after work, grab a drink, go to a cultural uh, uh, event, go to a Sox game, go Sox, um, mm -hmm. or whatever else needs to be done in life. And um, I think those trends uh, will work in Chicago's favor for a very long time. I just don't know when that will be, if that's 2021 or 2022 or 2023, uh, but our foundation is strong and I think we'll return to it entirely. Excellent. David, anything you'd like yeah. to add? Yeah, I mean, I tend to agree with that. I, I, I don't have the, sa the same, uh, I don't have a sort of doomsday lens on like, oh, this is the end of downtown. I've, you know, seen a bunch of articles about that as, as you know, kind of when COVID came out. And, and yeah, I tend to agree with, with Brad and with Samir. I think it will come back. It's just more of a matter of time. Uh, and But I do think there is an opportunity to, uh, you know, kind of maybe understand the, you know, understand kind of spinoff an opportunity to enhance sort of local, you know, sort of nodes in the neighborhoods where, you know, sort of as Samira mentioned, maybe it is like, you know, people Monday and when and, and Friday don't come into downtown, but maybe they go into their sort of local, you know, sort of neighborhood hub. And, and maybe that's a way to, to continue to kind of, you know, to have the vitality and energy and the activity from downtown, which, you know, we sorely need in Chicago, you know, it kind of uh, is the staple, it's the face of, of, of Chicago to the world. Um, 
but then how do you, you know, sort of align that and connect that with opportunities in the neighborhood? So this may be one of those ways that we can uh, start to understand how to do that. So Deputy Mayor, if that's the case where, you know, maybe people are not coming into the city as much on Mondays and Fridays, how does sectors like our retail and restaurants, you know, how do they survive again, kind of post vaccine? This is a critical question, right? I think especially for the um, entrepreneurs, business owners who are in the central area, um, you know, part of this is offset by a lot of the central area growth that we've seen, right? Our downtown uh, has over 100,000 residents and, and it is the fastest growing downtown uh, from a residential perspective in America over the past 20 years. Um, but I think it's also a challenge, uh, you know, when you think about city planning um, and, and what we have to do from a, just a planning framework perspective, we need to be thinking about new models downtown. And, you know, previously things that no one would consider, closing down streets, more outdoor dining, plazification, um, you know, the loop had this reputation of kind of shutting down at five o'clock, right? Um, and I think those sorts of elements are going to change, um, not only as the cultural vibrance that, uh, that, that Brad mentioned, you know, comes back and the theater district comes back, but also as we start rethinking uh, what it means to be downtown and maybe some of the buildings could be rezoned, uh, you know, from a hotel or a class B space to being uh, more residential. But I think the notion of attracting more people and more leisure travelers downtown during kind of off peak times is gonna to have to be a goal to tackle what could be some slight differentials in traffic between the neighborhoods and downtown. Great. So another question that was submitted reads, the Great Cities Institute reported there are 58,000 unfilled manufacturing jobs in the Chicago metro area. How can the city and partners promote the workforce development needs of manufacturers? Well, I, I know from the city perspective, this is something that we spent a lot of time thinking about. There is a huge kind of mismatch between matching the supply of the labor force with the demand of the labor force. Technology needs to play a, a big part of this. Um, and we are trying to improve our technology tools as a city, but we also are focusing our workforce development agencies. We have, uh, organizations like the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership and Skills for Chicagoland's Future um, that are increasingly now focusing on the manufacturing sector because of the example you just raised. Additionally, the TDNL and warehousing space, there's a lot of truck driving jobs open right now as well uh, and warehousing jobs. And so we're really catering those organizations to be better plugged in with community-based organizations so that we can match that supply and demand of, of talent. It is a definitely a, a a pretty significant challenge to do that, but it's something that was identified in our recovery task force report as something we have to do a better job uh, in 2021. Can I just briefly build on that? I think those were wise comments that to me, this is one of those headwinds for Chicago long-term. So if you think about the past 40, 50 years for Chicago, manufacturing has been a tail, uh, 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 sorry, I said tailwind, I meant uh, headwind, I meant tailwind. Uh, so manufacturing has been a real um, headwind, right? So the move of any major manufacturer was to lengthen their supply chain and make it cheaper. Uh, and that meant moving things out of central areas and away from customers. Uh, the opposite is happening now. So sh supply chains are shortening. Last mile matters more than ever in quality and innovation and the application of technology is as important as it's ever been. And so if you think what that means for a city in the middle of a country with lots of available land, incredible infrastructure, a world-class workforce, et cetera, I mean, it, it should be a, a mega trend for us that really we take advantage of. And, and, the, and the city has been doing a lot to do this. And, and our, to me, look no further than the new Ford plant or the newly um, renovated Ford plant on the south side of Chicago. It is Ford's most advanced technological plant in the country. And to me, it just shows the power of um, uh, whether it's Amazon's investments here, et cetera, we can build amazing things uh, in downtown or in the, in the urban core of Chicago and have that be a real asset of ours going forward. The story has flipped. The story has flipped. That's very, yeah. very interesting. David, um, do you have any insights into that? Yeah, I was just going to add in. I think I think this was actually something I was thinking about last night with the, you know, sort of we have this really, you know, sort of really uh, 
advantageous, you know, so position in sh Chicago, you know, sort of having this old school rail infrastructure that's really connected us to the rest of the nation in a really interesting way and made us a hub. Uh, but that, along with that, we also have you know, sort of the fiber infrastructure that's connected us to to the world and the digital economy. And we have this really interesting opportunity to really transform a lot of our former, you know, sort of uh, industrial, you know, spaces, former manufacturing, uh, you know, sort of uh, lots that have, you know, sort of uh, been torn down or, you know, sort of have the opportunity to really bring those back because of those connections already exist and they already uh, are something we can build on and start to really play off of the intersection of manufacturing and technology and how those, uh, can really uh, catalyze community. And I think, you know, sort of Pullman's done a, a fantastic job of this, really building off of uh, technology, uh, food, logistics. Uh, and there's a lot of, I think, other parts of the city that can uh, do the same and, and continue to kind of build off of that model. What else, um, from a city perspective, can we do to help our small and medium-sized businesses kind of weather this storm and again, you know, have growth opportunities. I'm focused, you know, this time next year, moving out, assuming that the vaccine is successful. Anybody thoughts? Well, I mean, I, I definitely think um, we need to be shopping local, you know, and, and, and certainly the city's tried to promote a lot of different initiatives to in, encourage that local stimulus. So think about the power of your dollar, right? All of us, are consuming things in different ways right now. And so, you know, my wife and I have a goal to order takeout two or three times a week, right? And, and kind of vary up where we're ordering it from. We have a takeout Chicago challenge, you know, to, to, to promote that. Last uh, Friday, um, we promoted something called Black Shop Friday, which is to promote black owned businesses. And, and you know, we, we said, put the black back in Black Friday. Mm -hmm. um, and and to really making sure that we, uh, you know, we have an online, um, kind of Rolodex of all those black owned businesses in the city. So it's blackshopfriday.com. Um, so you can, you can support them. Um, not to say that we, you know, supporting large retailers isn't um, something that is easier to do or, or natural. Um, so I'm not suggesting, you know, anything against those companies, but we need to be shopping more local. Um, you know, this has been a K-shaped recovery in the retail space. So by and large, a lot of national chains are doing quite well right now. And in the local businesses who were already facing headwinds because of e-commerce trends and, and now COVID's kind of doubled down on that. So I think we need to really be thoughtful about the power of our dollars and our consumption and consume very intentionally. Mm -hmm. well, one quick build on that. Uh, I also think the, the trillion dollars in corporate revenue that our Fortune 500 companies have is uh, also a great way to think about local. Uh, and that includes, you know, some basic ones like paper supply and catering and, you know, leasing contracts, et cetera, all the things that you think of as sort of the uh, important but commoditized part of their spend. But it also means the innovation part of what they're doing, right? So if, if you're going to um, build out a new analytics capability in your Discover uh, and you're thinking about, well, where do I find that? I can get that in Silicon Valley or from Civis Analytics right in the heart, heart of downtown Chicago. How do we raise awareness of our small businesses that are these emerging um, tech companies as well? And so uh, I know this is something the mayor's office is very focused on, something the business community is very focused on, and there's a diversity component to this as well. So if you think of that, that, that as a trillion dollars that could be spent on local businesses and local businesses owned by people of color or women, there's a lot of good you can do with that. That sounds really, really good. And so, David, you know, not to put you on the spot, but as a member of the Burnham Council, asking you to speak for kind of your generation, what, um, what do you think is a driving factor to keep people living downtown, you know, not necessarily leaving the urban area? Um, what do you think we need to do in order to make people, you know, keep people your age interested in staying downtown? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's ecosystem, uh, you know, as you know, folks mentioned, you, you have this sort of gradation of, you know, sort of people who, you know, may have grew up here and, you know, sort of try, trying to find opportunities. You have people who uh, may have went to school here and, you know, sort of may start out 
But, you know, once they start to get a family and start to look at schools and that sort of thing, then that starts to orient their decisions on where they can live, where they can connect to. So finding ways to, I think, continue to bolster those assets uh, and create that sort of network where you know how to, you know, sort of evolve, uh, you know, sort of as, as a young, you know, sort of talented person going into some, you know, kind of an early, you know, sort of marriage or a family, uh, and then, you know, sort of raising kids and, and, and all of that. So how do you uh, just continue to build that, that ecosystem and that character um, in those, in those places to keep people from moving out? Because that's kind of the, the story that I've heard from a lot of my colleagues. I don't have kids yet, but a lot of my friends who do, it's like, okay, start out here. Oh, well, I, you know, looking at schools, this is hard. Okay, I'm going to move over to Hyde Park, or I'm going to move to, you know, sort of north side, or I'm going to move out to the suburbs. Like, those are kind of the, the spaces. So how do we start to find ways to bolster the other parts of the city uh, where it's a, it's a really, it, it then could become more of a, like, I like this neighborhood, you know, I'm just going to stay here and, you know, sort of, or you try out a bunch of different neighborhoods. Cause I think there's some rich character and, and vibrance uh, in a lot of the places that, uh, that, you know, Chicago has. So how do we just continue to bolster those so that then that's the decision. It's like, Oh, I'm not going to move out of Chicago. It's like, where, which neighborhood do I want to move into? I want to go to Beverly because I want a larger house. I want to go over here because I like density and want to, you know, be next to Grant Park and Millennium Park. Uh, you know, there's trying to just build that, uh, uh, continue to build that ecosystem. Thank you. So we only have about 30 seconds. So Chris Hall, can you very quickly talk about what you see as next steps for um, focusing on Chicago's economy, kind of again, post vaccine? Yeah, I, I think there are, you know, all of the, the comments today have been great. I think focusing on sectors and then focusing on how we ensure as jobs grow back and we actually, as jobs grow, most of them will be in offices. Um, you know, so we will see that expansion, how we connect that to opportunity for the next generation of residents across all of the city and representing all of the city, um, taking their opportunities and gaining business and job opportunities within the, the central city. So I think that's a, a big challenge. Yes. And, and Andrew, can you very quickly talk about what our audience can expect tomorrow and Thursday? Yeah, tune in. Tune in tomorrow's conversation is going to be focused on the central city as destination. Uh, Michael Fosnock, the chief marketing officer of the city of Chicago, uh, Lou Raisin, the president of Broadway in Chicago, and then myself uh, will be joining the panel for, for tomorrow. And then finally, on Thursday, we're focusing on aspects of livability, the residential components, the amenities, safety, those types of things. We have a great group of four panelists lined up for Thursday as well. Thank you. So I do want to thank our panelists and Chris Hall and Andrew Broderick for joining us today. I think one of the takeaways that, that I'm left with is, you know, we really have an opportunity to embrace the, the safety mechanisms to put in place. As the deputy mayor mentioned, you know, it is, it, people have to feel safe in order to want to go at, to work or to go to a restaurant or to go shopping. And, you know, COVID-19, let's hope that it's another hundred years before we face anything like this again, but we should be prepared so that if there is something else, we, you know, can be more agile and respond to it. I was excited to hear about the, the different sectors um, that Brad talked about and, and the fact that there is real opportunity for Chicago to be on the world stage in, in kind of the futuristic uh, areas of work. And if we're really committed to embracing those and creating the workforce, it will um, really be a legacy for Chicago um, in the world. And David, I really appreciate your perspective as an architect and as a member of our Burnham Council in terms of what to, uh, some of the things that we need to embrace in, in order for the changes in our homes and in our offices. And we didn't get a chance to talk about open spaces, but we will on Thursday. So with that, thank you to our audience for dialing in today. We look forward to um, having you join us tomorrow and Thursday. The sessions are being recorded and we will post them on the CCAC website. We'll also be following up um, later this month and early next year for you to get involved in some additional work that we will be doing to build on these conversations to again, help our city recover both um, for a quicker growth uh, comeback from the 
the, that we saw in the Great Recession and a more equitable recovery. So thank you for your support. Thank you for joining us today. Stay well, happy holidays. Uh, Samir, Brad, David, Andrew, Chris, thank you all so very much. We're lucky to hear from you. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Happy holidays. Right. Thanks everybody. Thank you.